much. I'm delighted to be here to present a really distinguished panel. We have Claudio Miranda, who is the cinematographer on Oblivion. Alex, Alex Carr, who is the DIT. David Waters, uh, VP of Location Services for Technicolor. And we have uh, Keith Vidger from Sony Electronics, so if you have any serious technical <laughs> specifications, he'll, he'll be the man to talk to about that. So before we get into the, uh, the discussions, let's take a look at the trailer from Oblivion, please. The last Super Bowl was played right here. Jason, tell me it was a classic. Classic game. 80,000 people on their feet. Seconds left on the clock. No. So Hubie throws a Hail Mary. Touchdown! 166, back online. 60 years ago, Earth was attacked. We won the war, but they destroyed half the planet. Everyone's been evacuated. Nothing human remains. We're here for drone repair with a mop-up crew. This is Jack Harper. I'm good to go. Two more weeks, Jack, and we can finally leave and join the others. Don't take any chances. Okay, now the trailer I believe was in, we're seeing it in 2K, but the treat will be coming up later in the program. We're going to be seeing some, a, a scene in uh, true 4K, shot from 4K and projected in 4K. So uh, anyway, welcome everybody. I see a lot of distinguished guests here. Denny Claremont, Otto Nemens, Curtis Clark, um, uh, people from Technicolor, Fujinon. So I think you're going to keep us on our toes. Yay, <laughs> all right, good. Hey, yes, Robert. exactly. Hey. Um, I'd like to see a show of hands quickly. How many people here are in, on, on the camera end of things? Cinematographers, camera assistants? Okay, oh, a lot of us, good. How many are in post-production? Okay, all, equal number, uh, producers, directors? Great, okay, so we have a good balanced crowd. Right. So let the games begin. Um, this pr probably was the first film uh, that we're all seeing shot with an F-65, first major motion picture. Claudio, you shot it. Tell us a little bit about uh, shooting with it. Um, you know, normally when I start a movie, I do test a bunch of cameras against each other, and uh, Oblivion had a certain, a um, lot of requirements for the shoot. You read the script, you kind of go over the story, and one thing we definitely wanted was initially a 4K release, even though Oblivion is now a 2K release. But um, we, you know, there's a definite kind of architectural cleanliness that I do like to the F-65 that was for it. There is definitely a, um, there's a sky tower scene and we shot that all with uh, all front projection. It had 21 projectors around it. And that, that all the architecture is a very kind of clean architecture. And um, 
So there's two kind of looks in this in, in Oblivion. There's one where we're kind of in this clean, futuristic tower that's supposed to be in this unbelievable structure that's 3,000 feet in the air. And then there's the ground, which has this kind of gritty, kind of dirty look. And we shot a lot of the, the ground plates and a lot of the atmosphere in Iceland. And what we really loved about, you know, that there were a lot of challenges of the movie. And one of the challenges is even in the location in Iceland to be able to capture um, an, an overcast sky, which is very kind of white, and volcanic black earth. And I just knew that would be a pretty tremendous challenge. And we want to see all the sharps and all the nuances in the volcanic earth. And uh, we, you know, we sat up there with a you know helicopter crew. We had the eclipse ball, and uh, we and I sent. I think we shot it with the F sixty five, and I think we shot a lot of that stuff with the uh, uh, Fujinon fourteen to um, the fourteen point five to forty five zoom. And it's that footage is awesome. Uh, you know, all the, the raw footage of that is great. And we just, that was what we were really attracted to. And, um, okay. Um, how would you describe the look of Oblivion in terms of a style? Well, that was what I was kind of talking about. A little bit, I think it has like two styles. Like, the, I think the, when you go to the future world, it has a little bit more, more it's a little more clean. It's a little, a little bit more, you know, septic and sterile, which is kind of, kind of what that, that, that kind of vibe should be. And then you get down to the earth, and I definitely feel like there's a, Kind of a little, just add a little bit more meat, a little more grunge to it, you know. And uh, there's definitely a place, you know. There's, you know, the story points about coming down to the earth and see it, and there's a little bit of, you know, she, she loves her place at the, in the th three thousand feet in the air. And I just, uh, you know, it's important to have those two distinguished looks. And then, you know, and I knew also too, I was going to have a lot of, you know, explosions, and I didn't want to deal with rolling shutter or just or just sort of slanted frame rates and all, you know, I, I, there's a lot of camera movements, there's, you know, I mean, you could see we're blowing things up everywhere. So it's also very important, like when something does blow up, uh, you just don't want it to fold over into, you want all the highlights to kind of roll over and see the end of the explosions. I mean, I, I like, I light a lot, I, I don't really do a lot of faux lighting, so I kind of like when, you know, if there's fire on the set, I just kind of bring fire bars and I light by that. There's one scene in here that's also amazing in the Sky Tower. I put a candle uh, in the middle of a table and there's almost, and normally I'm kind of happy to do that if they're around, you know, pretty intimate and close, but what was really amazing is that they were almost eight feet apart from each other and there's this one little candle that's just doing the whole, that's, that's what's lighting. There's not a light around for 100 feet of that scene and it's, uh, and what's amazing about that candle is you see the candle, you see the flame coming off it, and you also see um, everyone's faces. You see the eye light and the flame. The interactor is as it flickers. You know, that's an interactive flicker. You're not doing a faux light out of frame to try to do that stuff, which I just, I don't even know where that light would go. I'm dealing in a, in a house that's full of glass. I mean, you put, I put, you put a faux film light on, you know, that's just going to be, this. and we, what we want to do is everything in camera for that sky tower scene. So it's all, so that candle is all in camera when you, when you see it in the, uh, there's like a, be this little release. And what's amazing, it's all, it's all projection. It's all glass, it's all real skin reflections, it's all skin subsurface refractions, it's all that stuff that you get from being in an immersive environment is all on screen. And that, that, there's a couple things that I think are pretty amazing. Um, there's this, you know, and, the, and we also we did the whole projection thing and there's shots so you see Tom from going inside to outside. But though that's possible because now we have cameras that are, that are sensitive to capture that. And I don't think that's, that's possible. I mean, I had, we had 21 projectors and you know, 800 ASA, I was, my exposure was a 1.4, you know. That's a lot. <laughs> so that's, we just made it, you know. Shall we take a look at, shall we take a look at the 4K sure. uh, scene? Let's, let's roll that, please. Um, Claudia, if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about something that I think is unique. You were using a uh, 270-degree uh, screen where you front-projected uh, material, mm -hmm. and that actually was the lighting. It was a lot of the lighting. I mean, Z actually, Zach is here, <laughs> who is a uh, part of the, um, who has uh, helped us for, what was it two or three weeks we set that thing up? Yeah. Anyway, it was, uh, it was, it was quite a task. I mean, we had, we spent, I spent a lot of time with Zach, and we were, like, designing the whole uh, projection, and what we really want is what I used mainly was the light coming off the projector. So, as if it's sunset, that sunset lighting that's filling most of the stage. If it's 
if it's, you know, a bright sunny day, you know, there's a whole, it was, you know, about, that was, it was 500, roughly 500 feet, just a little, little bit shy, and about 42 foot high, and that's a tremendous amount of light. And then what I could also do with that, it was a, I could cheat little things, like I could put a little white band or add, to, you know, I could make some a little bit white if I just need a little bit more. But what's great, there's some scenes of Vic in the control tower, and she has these, because you're shooting at these low stops, she has these, her eyes are extremely dilated, and you see in the reflection, you see all the cloudscapes, you see all the real light. It's not just a, a square frame that you see in her eyes, you see actually the whole sky, and that's the color temp that's hitting her. And for me, that's just, that just feels so grounded. Um, and the first shot that we did that really kind of set the, the tone of, of the whole movie, we did a shot where Tom's coming up, up the stairs, and it's a whole glass house, it's 12 foot high glass, and he gets up, he goes out, he says goodbye to Vicka, he comes out the door, the doors open up, and, um, and then he leaves frame, and he goes outside the building. And I didn't think actually that would be possible. I, didn't, I thought that would be you know, projection, we would see it, it's too big a scope, and, and I promised the director that we could only be able to do medium to tight shots. Uh, I'm not sure about wide shots, I was worried about parallax and other problems, but um, you know, the way we, everything was done, we did wide shots as well. And I think it's a little bit because you know, clouds have an organic nature of moving, so parallax problems are kind of um, put down, but, but that, it just, it just, you know, I loved it more than anything. You make lighting choices much differently than you would if, whether it was a blue screen. Your lighting choices of like, you know, you see a lot of stuff silhouette because it just because it looks great. You know, you don't need more. You don't need to. See, you see enough of the face. You see the wrap on their face from the, the clouds in the sky, and, and it's just being edged by this huge giant scenery. Um, Tell us what we're seeing there. <laughs> what what is that? That's just me, you know, <laughs> on a hot day. Well, it's hot and windy. Well, it what's what's the equipment on there? Uh, you know, that's the, I think it's the, it's the Fuji Zoom. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's, is it 24 to 180? Someone read that? No, it's a 1885. 1885? Yeah, the 1885 was probably the, the it's more a, It's standard. a 24 to 180 on the um, G3 head. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably shot, I think that was probably on like a, you know, a Chapman. It was like we had the 70 foot Technocrane going up over the dunes. And uh, we really wanted to keep this movie as grounded to um, Earth and not, you know, the extensions are really kind of uh, real peripheral extensions. Even like some of the stuff you'll see, like even on the trailer, like you'll see the, um, the uh, Washington Monument on the side. I mean, all that's not, all, that is real shot scenery with embedded uh, CG uh, places. So. Even though it's not a it's not a fully created CG environment, that's actually real photography with elements inside that photography of CG. I think you like to shoot as much in camera as possible. Is that correct? I I, I fight as hard as I can to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just think it's there's something about just I think skin tones in general and what you can do and try to minimize your blue screen and, and people I think interact well with I think even actors. I mean the thing also what was great about the, the Sky Tower set and projection as well, is the actors actually were grounded to the set. They weren't in a world where it was all, they had to like imagine, imagine put imagination beyond the set. I mean, there's a, you know, Tom just goes to me and goes, man, I just love being here. I'm, I'm in a building in the clouds and it just, I feel a, a fantastic, you know, I, I don't know, he was very emotional about it to me, you know, and, and, you, and you walk on that set, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty emotional thing and it's definitely something very, Something I wanted to try with uh, on Tron. I want to, you know, I like doing a lot of interactive and projected light, and it's something I wanted to try, and it was something we finally were able to do on this movie. Now, how did you deal with um, filters or no filters? Um, here you have an 8K camera, and uh, you're filming talent and actresses. What, right. what do you do? I'm not, I, did, I, I know I'm going to be in part of the diva, DI, so I know I could always kind of downgrade and muck up things and make the woman look beautiful, and you know, sometimes you know you, you have to do cosmetic choices a little bit toward the end. Sometimes they wake up a little tired. And, you know, you always want to be nice to the ladies, so. But Tom is 4K rated, so. <laughs> <laughs> 4K rated, that's a great new term. 4K rated actors and actresses. Yeah. Well, now, now that we're in decay, let's talk a little technical. Um, you're shooting, and Alex, you're the DIT on set, and you're uh, near set, so t take us through this whole workflow of uh, getting the data out of the F-65 and I guess ultimately onto the screen and let's go one by one. Well, um, 
I had designed a cart that basically would uh, talk would louder. would be able to uh, talk talk <laughs> talk louder. <laughs> I, I, I had designed two carts with two BVM F250s, so Claudia would have one, I would have one, and the director had two. And uh, on my cart, I had a computer system that would hook up to the PC4, that I could look at the, all of the cards and the media that was, that was shot. But also on that same computer, I'd be able to remote Ethernet into the F65. And I'd be able to change frame rate, shutter, in D filters, frame lines. I had almost 95% of control of the camera, and that was one of the most powerful parts of this 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 camera uh, being being on uh, crane and remote locations so much. I mean, it was very powerful. But in on this same system, I'm able to put in the card, check time code, check that we what we shot was on the camera report, um, and vice versa. And then uh, I would then uh, uh, as the cards were completed, you know, ready through my system, I wouldn't I wouldn't download any media. I'd do, I would download selective shots to spot check and things like that. And I'd also download for lighting reference on, in future shots to, to match. But then uh, the cards would go to Technicolor, uh, this trailer that would be nearby set where they would be uh, transferred with a PC4 with a 10 gigabit ethernet and then they would, uh, they would be LTO archived there near the set. And you could probably tell us a lot more about the trailer. So Dave, once the, um, you get the data, how, what do you do with it? So we had a trailer that we constructed. It was kind of a unique opportunity for workflow on Oblivion. Um, the trailer was constructed dual purpose. One was to um, process dailies every day. The other was to screen dailies every day. And so for that, we had an SRPC4 that we would transfer the cards onto a 300 terabyte NAS. We built a NAS for this show because we were told early on that What's we What's a NAS? It's a, a network attached storage device. So it's low cost, it's not as fast in speed. It wasn't what we were using to process the dailies, but it was an archive for the 4K material. We wanted to give Joe and Claudio the ability to recall any shots in the production, the 4K shots for the entire film, for, from Louisiana to New York to Iceland back to Mammoth. And the NAS also served as a chance for us to put into the facility after principal photography was done be able to pull our VFX backplates from that and also do the DI conform without touching the LTO. So it worked out really well. But besides processing dailies in the trailer, the other thing that we would do is daily screenings. And for those, we were using our frame logic system, which has a color front, front end for color grading. When they would come into the screening each day, what they would actually be viewing is the 4K material being debared in real time with grades, non-destructive grades on top of it. So if there were times where they needed to warm up or cool a shot down, they had our colorist there during the screening who could perform that as well. So um, did you watch dailies um, every day or? Not as much when we got to Iceland. Iceland was a little bit more rogue. Well, they, they, were, they were in uh, Reykjavik. <laughs> they were a little, a little Alex, you, you told a good story about uh, uh, data in Iceland. Well, um, the producers were a little worried about uh, shipping our cards by helicopter back to Reykjavik because we were in two areas in Iceland. We were near the volcano Hekla in the south central area. We were also out to the north eastern part of the island uh, for a giant stadium set. And when we first started in giant stadium, the producers were a little worried about uh, sending that data. So uh, they asked me, well, can, is there a way that you can download the footage before, it, before it's shipped off? I'm like, well, I'm not necessarily 100% prepared to do that, but I'll, I'll, I'll make do with the two PC4s that I had, and uh, I was able to transfer the cards in a reasonable amount of time, not what I would expect to, to have at this point with a 10 gigabit Ethernet setup, but uh, you know, I, I was able to transfer the cards and then have my own copy on set, which I could recall for Joe and Claudio at, at, at any point that I, I needed, and I'd use you know, just uh, black magic hardware and DaVinci to, to re-output back to, uh, to a monitor for, for them to see. And I had my own uh, SAS array there that I could play back real time with. So um, it, it didn't always come up as often because we were in, in rough locations, but um, you know, it was, I, we'd be able to pull up frames and be able to look at things. And, uh, and then the cars would go off to Technicolor and we'd hear back and say, great, everything's great. So in, uh, just in terms of physical, practical time, you shoot a scene, uh, you're going to probably either 512 um, gig cards or uh, one terabyte we, cards? Well, we started the movie with 25 512 gigabyte cards. We wanted the black high-speed cards so that you know, one 512 was our 30-minute load and uh, we could go high-speed or uh, 24 or 60 or 
on those cards at, at will, and we wouldn't need to reload or do any kind of change. And um, you know, but we also got some one terabyte cards also that are limited to 25 frames uh, uh, per second. So uh, for the, the dialogue scenes, you know, we would maybe start the day with a one terabyte card, and then we would go to the high speed cards later on. But the the the, high, the higher speed cards are a little faster to download, um, not only because they're smaller, but because the write speed is higher. Um, the one terabyte cards, the write speeds are just, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not terrible. But, uh, and how much time does it take to um, download it on this, on your onset cart? And how much time does it then take at, uh, at your end? Well, um, for me, I was limited to one gigabit ethernet on one of my readers, and I was limited to eSATA on the other reader. So I was on a very slow boat. So um, I made do with what I had with two readers and coordinating the time to reload, and, and you know, all, that's a big part of it, not just the connection speed, you know, it's the, the, the situations you're in. But um, I mean, your, your speeds, you should know. The Air speed was closer to real time. Yeah, and that's what I've found after you know, working recently with F65 is that you know, it's 30 minutes and one hour for a card, but there are 30 minute and one hour loads. So you know, that's practically real time. And, and Claudio, tell us a little bit about doing the DI and the, the final stretch. Um, I mean, we shipped, uh, we've, uh, we did, uh, Mike Soa was the DI colorist on this movie. Um, we wanted to be close to Skywalker Ranch where we were doing the, uh, all the sound. And nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> sorry, it was a snappy tune. Um, uh, so it was beautiful. We spent the time in Skywalker Ranch. We brought uh, Technicolor up, and uh, you know Joe would come in and do sound, and I would actually have fun looking at sound as well. And we just spent time in a dark room for uh, three weeks up there, just uh, grading ob Oblivion. It was very um, it's easy footage to grade. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like this whole thing is pretty seamless and not terribly <coughs> difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean. There wasn't necessarily any special equipment we needed. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of, you know, I had a lot of advantages. A lot of people say it's big or clunky. I just, I don't really have those issues. I'm not, but I'm not really the super handheld running guy. So I like, you know, I like cranes, I like dollies, I like cinematic moves and stuff. I'm not too much bouncing around. But even if I did, I, I, I you know, I put the camera on my shoulders and it wasn't a big deal for me. I mean, I don't have any of those kind of, you know, we had, we've had worst case scenarios. We had, you know, operators, my operators had, 12 to 1 Panavision 1,000 foot mags, those are the old days. That's really, that's quite something to put on your shoulders. And, and they're used to it. That's, that was standard, you know, standard issue. You know, one operator, they gotta be, you know, they man up, so. And um, <laughs> I, I don't really tolerate too much anyway. But, um, but I have no problem with it, you know. And now, now there's also the, uh, you know, the F55, which is, I think, it would be a great companion as well if you wanna be just a little bit smaller and get in tighter places as well. So I do think there's, uh, I have no issues with it, so I don't have it. You know, people talk about like data rates like being too much or too this, and I don't, I don't have those problems at all for me. Now, you had, um, I see in that picture, you have four of the Fujinon premieres. Do you mostly shoot on the Zoom? Uh, outside, you know, I found the, the the Zoom's just incredibly sharp. I mean, I was pretty amazed how sharp they were. There was no reason for me to go on prime top of the time, and, and if I'm off the end of a cliff, you know, 3,000 foot drop, you know? And, uh, you know, and that was the other thing, you know, clouds came in, I needed to open up stop. I wanted to kind of keep a little bit of certain focal uh, range so I don't have to bring the crane back in and then re nd back up or down. It was just easy just to kind of change it, change the focal run, and then you're ready to go. And, you know, and I have an actor out there who's on the edge of a cliff, you know, cable, cabled in. You know, it's, I don't want to futz around too much, you know. Yeah. And, and, and then, uh, sorry? The, you know, just in the same thing is that you know we we can change ND filters remotely, and that's a very powerful situation when you're on a 75 foot crane off of a cliff, and it's just you know to, to to pull it back in and and just not it's much easier to be able to do it remotely. It's, and then for the interiors, you're using uh, Master Primes, I guess. For Master Primes, I needed the the light level, and uh, it also helped a little bit too because you know the projections aren't the the clouds aren't exactly you know, 100 miles away there, <laughs> you know, at the closest end, they're probably about 50 foot, uh, 50 foot away from the set. And well, maybe one point was probably even like 20 feet. So it just, it helped to, not only helped that, I, well, I practically needed the light level, but I also think the depth of field also helped bury the distance as well, which I think was very helpful. Um, 
but you know, all the stuff that you saw was remote, you know, the in camera, which I think is, I think it works pretty good. And you know, and for, for doing that in a way, there was, uh, I think there was a VFX um, uh, supervisor told me it was, it would be, if it was all blue screen, it would be 1,500 shots VFX, and we cut it down to 800. So what do you think? Should we open it up to questions from the audience? So, all right, let the games begin. If you uh, have questions, please go up to the microphone and uh, ask your questions. I'll repeat them if, yeah, go ahead. I, I would like to ask uh, mostly DI and uh, other managers, is it not more cheaper and faster to make so name it dailies just for the um, out, uh, monitor output of the camera because there's two output, one with metadata, another without metadata. So you just record with Gemini or whatever, you have dailies without making a uh, lot of files, uh, compressing ultra big files, etc. It's maybe more cheap and f fast to do that just from the uh, monitor output of the camera. David, do you want to answer that? I didn't, no? I didn't get that. Oh, I think what he's saying is like, wouldn't it be just cheaper just to do the monitor rather than do transconing for editorial? Is uh, that what I think? Is that what you're talking about? Or I mean, we do, we do view I, monitor out. Yeah, but you still have a double system. You're shooting sound separately, so sound has to be sunk. Yeah. You have to make sure you provide all the proper metadata for the Avid ALE and doing LTO. So while you could do that, you wouldn't have sunk sound. They'd have to sync it in the Avid. Most of the time, they want consolidated media for Avid. That and, and also. Okay, uh, let, I'm sorry, could we have. Because it's more cheaper and uh, faster to have this, uh, this dailies just for monitor out and to keep big files for the lab. Um, like I said, I don't have any of those issues. You know, I just, we just kind of, I just I shoot it. It doesn't take us any time to generate uh, media for any type. But we, we have a playback guy on set. If I need to do it, he's storing it from the monitor out. I mean, that's that, you know, our, our, our playback guy, Wayne, had, was running a system. I think he was running, what do you have, Raptors? He has a three Raptors. So he had like three Raptors, so we could also preview on there. But it's nothing I really want to grade from or really do anything more than that. But, the, the, you know, being able to color and screen dailies, I mean, that kind of, ma making the Avid Media isn't necessarily the, the biggest uh, process. You know, it's not, not, you know, it's, with the F65 files, so you don't, it's not a tremendous render from 4K to uh, MXF 145, you know, it's not. I mean, we've done like really just simple commercials together and it's, and he just takes his little cart with me and we generate all the media from there and all the deliverables and it's, you know, so you know and it's, he, he stays for like probably a half an hour after the set's done and it's all, and all the media is out there. So it's oh, no. not, you have the right gear, it's not a problem. Yeah, I mean, question over there, please. Sure, uh, John Trask. Question, uh, how closely were you working with the uh, editor during uh, production, and uh, did you uh, have a lot of contact with him um, after production was finished? <laughs> it's kind of a funny, a little, a little bit of a funny story about that. <laughs> I found myself actually having, because I did kind of spend a little time in the DR trailing doing the Avid grades that went out, and then I had to do like a friends and fam family kind of they do like little screenings off the Avid output as well. I forgot it was, uh, what's the 150 DNX one? It's like 145 one, for 24. I'm not think. sure exactly the one, but the higher quality one. And there was some, you know, general like um, screening for, you know, the, you know, the heads of Universal to, you know, just to see how the movie's going. So actually I spent some time doing Avid grading, <laughs> you know, pushing looks in there. So I actually have a little bit, I was, we were all kind of together, so I was kind of, setting the looks on the Avid, so, you know, it was a temporarily kind of crude DI, but actually it turned out pretty great, so I spent a lot of time with, you know, our editor and that little whole side. Richard, Richard Bruce that you were yes. working with? Yeah. yeah. He's great. Thank you. I have a quick follow-up question. What were you uh, using to monitor on set, and how were you monitoring on set? Well, um, you know, like I said earlier, we, we use the, the Sony BVM F250. You know, it's the same panel as the E, but has uh, doesn't have some of the, the software. And the camera was set how? The, the camera, we were, we were always viewing a S-Log2 with the S-Gamma setting. So we were seeing the widest uh, uh, color range and the flattest curve. We didn't look at Rec. 709. So um, I would, we'd have some adjustments in the BVM that we'd be able to, to, to turn on for, for color and for okay. contrast, you know, mm -hmm. that we'd look at. But okay. Um, I mean, we, we really wanted to see what the, the range was right there on, on set rather than going to something like Rec. 709. And, and then, I mean, that, that changes the way that the, the lighting decisions will be made. You know, if you're looking into deep blacks and, you know, you, you want to pump something in there, it's like, 
it's just you know the the, the S log curve is not this, it's not the same curve you're looking at out of like a, a log C setting. So right. so it's it it's not the highest contrast thing, but it is it is it is you know it, you can work with it well in in this, this kind of situation. And also we played a lot with the, the little high low setting, you know, the highlight detail, and then there's a little low light detail. Like something if I just really want to know if something's clipping or not, and I'm just kind of running with the camera. I just want to make sure something's in. I can just hit the, the what you know, there's a button that says what's in the highlights and the button which hits in the low lights. So I could be pretty I could be kind of down dirty if I want to be. You know, I don't have to be too overly precious. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Most of my questions right there. So S gamut, S log two, you're using high low key to see if you're clipping. Are you uh, approaching it with like photometric measurements? Um, you know, taking out your light meter and spotting it like film, or it how, really, it really how are you did, treating it? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's easier if it's overcast and the clouds are just kind of pushing in and out like a little bit. I'll just put a meter for that just to kind of make sure the scene kind of stays in a, in a consistent place. I mean, I do have a waveform monitor, and I can kind of sometimes I'll do I'll, sometimes I'll do set a mark for that. But it really depends on where I am with towns, and if I don't want to go back to the 10, I'll just pull a meter out and just, I, I go, I, I kind of mainly stay on waveform, but 10% of the time I might go meter. It, it really kind of, it's all, it's all available. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I was gonna ask that question also. Where do you spend most of your time in the, uh, in the video village? In, uh, uh, I, have my, I have my own little like side thing that I kind of keep. It's a very small little, little cart and I, I, um, everyone on my team, operators and everyone, we're all clear calm together, so I can, we're, all, we're on our own little communication that tell operators push in, pull out. Um, I'll be on Alex if I'm running out, and we'll talk about just uh, you know throwing in NDs or something, he could just through remote. Um, uh, several times I was um, a thousand feet away over fiber optics, and I was, I was carrying, um, the, the funny thing about uh, the cart that I built for Claudio is that it had a Blackmagic router on it, and I would take all of the signals from the cameras into his cart, so we'd have A, B, and C. Then we'd have A, B, and C going to VTR, and then A, B, and C playback coming back from VTR. So Claudio could sit there and look at live and playback as it was happening instantly on, on his own switch, and there's, yeah. there was a quad split there for multiple cameras. Yeah, that's a problem I find, like, sometimes on set, like, I find that my monitor gets hijacked a lot by, you know, so, and I kind of really, truly hate that. So, so like, to say, like, you're, you're, I mean, just imagine, right? So you have the director, you know, he's, you want to watch playback, right? This is when you totally get hijacked. This is why I just want my own, like, thing on the side, so I can continue lighting the next setup. So what happens, the director goes up, and he <laughs> drives me freaking, yeah, sorry, drives me nuts. So then he's watching playback over and over and over scene, and I'm, I can't get access to those monitors. That's why I just like having my own little world on the side. I can either have, I can either switch in so I can watch playback and see if we got focus or check back, or I can go to live and help, you know, help light the next setup. And I can talk to my operator with that. So for me, I like having that little, I'll be right next to the director, but I'll just have my own, my own system, you know, that's just off. I just, you know. And we didn't really, I mean, we had like pop-up tents, but we didn't really have a, a, any dip tents because uh, I created these shades. I used like the backstage rack mount cart that's just a simple, small unit. And the BVM is on the back and it fits nicely onto the edge so it's supported by the baby pin in the sides. But then I created these, uh, these sides and this shade that came up. It looked very much like an old arcade machine. But um, you know, we had you know, twin carts. His was much more powerful. But um, <laughs> you know, so you could just stick your head in, and you'd be fine. You know, you could. You'd I, need to, I didn't. Sometimes you know, we just couldn't afford to put all the big stuff. My, you know, my thing was just like just, just a little. That's all I needed. Yeah, lots of buttons. Yes. How many cameras shoot, and why? Uh, performance sometimes. You know, like if an actor. I mean, normally sometimes you'll you'll. There's always a trade-off, like what's more important? Sometimes you need to do double overs. It's not an ideal for your DP, but sometimes there's a point where you have to actually trade off performance. If, if there, was, there was a time, you know, Tom acted with a main, a main actor, and you just, you just know this is precious moments between two actors, you know, I, I usually bend for that. And, you, and, you, and sometimes the lighting is straight. In, in you know between them, and I, I will for performance. I usually you know you, you weigh everything and what's more important, and I'll weigh performance a lot. So on this show, there were how many cameras? There was two, but mainly using one most of the time. I like one, but 
you know, critical times when you have to do matching overs and two people are ad-libbing going back and forth. You know, uh, that's, those are kind of moments you kind of go. I have a question. We're looking at this shot here. I see a cinematography electronics focus cine tape. Uh, you're shooting probably at a 1-3-2 uh, split. Oh, that's the right? same. So that's yeah, but, but indoors you were shooting with the wide open on a prime, right? Well, so that, well that, was, that, was, that, that looks like Raven Rock, where we had a lot of, I had a lot of places to light that one up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. It was projections that I needed to be. But in general, when you're shooting at really low light level um, and things are moving, did you have any uh, focus issues or how did you deal with focus? No, I mean, you know, my, 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 uh, my assistant has, you know, he, does, he has his own crazy monitor set up and he's just sitting there glued. Mostly he doesn't pay attention too much to the, it's a reference on, the, on his thing, but he's mostly writing, peeking back and forth. He's good. There's a, there's Sorry, a writing what? Uh, the peaking on a monitor back and forth, and he's very good at that. He used the Astro 15 inch. It's a very old monitor, but it's, um, it's his favorite. It says, it says everyone has his own little tool, but he uses that, and he's he's, he's very good at it. Because we're into a new world of uh, focus, probably as these cameras are getting more and more sensitive, and uh, you know it's it's getting hard to see it in the eyepiece. There's a there's a I think there was a good shot even in the trailer of like a Tom, and there's I think I was on like a a 150 with a two, my, uh, two diopter on it. And it's, and it's literally, I, I think, probably about an eighth inch depth of field, you know? I think by the time you get all that together at that distance. And then, which is really interesting, because in, in, you know, in the digital world, you know, you can definitely see where that focus is, and you're just getting the, the tip of the eye in, and it's, it, it falls off tremendously. It looks pretty fantastic, and it's, and you just need, <laughs> I need, I need my focus puller to be pretty great at that, so he's good. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was ignoring this. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, the topic of using higher frame rates is something that's come up um, in recent, you know, in recent months, especially with the Hobbit. Uh, John Landau was here um, a few days ago speaking about how it makes it much more easier for the, you know, the audience and the viewer to really experience the narrative in a really more, much more vivid way, mm. and you become much more part of the story, much more emotionally involved. But I'm kind of curious, I mean, is if, in, if you're doing a film that's much more subtle and much more about the emotion and expression, is the use of 48 frames and 60 frames, is that where it falls short? Or is, can you know, that higher frame rate and that more sort of realistic aesthetic you know, still be as expressive, do you think? <laughs> uh, do, or do you want my opinion about 48? Or? <laughs> I would like your opinion, yes. <laughs> Wow, it's on the spot. Um, I I I don't li I don't like it. Um, <laughs> I think you have a few fans. I, I you know I you know I just did a test you know and I took um, 15 perf IMAX, 8 perf uh, iWorks, 5 perf and I I did I shot iWorks at 48 frames, just to try to get my own head about about like what am I looking at to really try to investigate for myself. And I shot even film, uh, 35 mil film, because you know some people think maybe it was a digital thing. And I, you know, I remember back in the day when I shot commercials, and I did one commercial that I had to do 30 for 30, you know. And I just remember, ooh, wow, that just became very electronic feeling for me. And, and, and I'm emotionally, I'm not, I'm not connected to anything, of, you know above that personally. I mean, it's a personal taste, you know. Uh, you know, I, people talk about like you, you know, people strobing and panning, but I'm used to operating for it, you know. I'll, you know, I'll see an actor, I'll go with them, and I, I, you know, I see some great movies that I love it. I, don't, I wouldn't want like the movies I love at the past to be, I wouldn't want, you know, I don't need Apocalypse Now at 48, I don't need, you know, I don't need Blade Runner at those frames. I am totally happy with the way they were shot, and I think they're beautiful, and I, and I think, Wow, I, gonna, I hope I don't, no one's going to kill me for this, but I just, I just don't, I, 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 and I did, I did do tests, and I really try to work, and I, I'm, I'm very open to the whole thing, and I was open in the very beginning of that. I just, uh, it's disturbing to me. I just, uh, and, I, and, I, and I really took it as a challenge to see like, how I could make this, and I, 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 maybe I'm not that good. I couldn't, I, I tried. Um, sorry. That's <laughs> 
Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, I've got a question about your usage of the lighting using the projectors. I know you said you had 21 projectors, but you obviously didn't have 21 cameras to shoot that. Maybe a little bit more information. On oh, sorry, yeah. We and did you fly a helicopter, or was it out from a mountaintop? Oh, or how did you top in Hawaii. create those planes? I think Alex yeah. went I was, there. I was there. Um, he, we sent him there with 15, <laughs> uh, with three uh, epics doing 15K. So that was 15K source material. So you had no aberration issues really on the edges uh, when you're projecting? It was it. all dealt with with uh, Pixamundo, put all the VFX, stitch those two cameras together and fix any aberrations and help blend all those things into one seamless. And then they actually helped separate it onto 10 servers, right? Right. That helped. Uh, so they had actually Parsec. Each server had its own task to play. And Zach worked uh, closely with Pixamundo on allocating once they had the seam and then dividing all those sources between all the servers. Well, I think it's really effective, and it'd be great if we could see it again. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's a, just a simple request. Sure, it's, it's only a one minute thing. I mean, yeah, you want, let's you do want to see it again? I mean, you uh, want to see it again? Uh, okay. Can we roll the one minute uh, 4K clip again, please? So, so the um, dusk hour right? lighting was actually shot on the volcano at magic hour and it, dusk, and that's how you got those gorgeous colors. Mm -hmm. at, uh, yeah, we, you know, we always kind of, yeah, Haleakala, we, we kind of did play a little bit. I mean, there was one scene that was done day for night, and I've obviously VFX put there's a, in the future the moon got blown up, so there's this little bit of kind of Saturn scattering of effect of scattering debris across the sky. So that's, that was, uh, they added that in CGI, so, but that was on our plate that we shot. Yes. Hi, I had a question about the, about the relationship between the director and the cinematographer. Um, I know this is, I believe this is the second project you work with a director, the last one was Tron. Actually, mm -hmm. the last scene had some uh, similar elements in the shot composition and coloring. Um, but I was curious, when the director brings his vision to you, how, uh, and he goes, uh, I really want this for the scene, Do you, does he just leave it at like, well, I really want someone running along a cliff, and then you got and then you're like, all right, we're going to shoot it this way, or is it much more specific? And he's like, I want the camera this way, this way, this way, or how much of a input uh, do you want from a director, and then you take that and put the shot composition together? I mean, I love when we come, you know, get references together, and I try to figure out how to make those references. I mean, the projection idea is something that Joe and I talked about a long time ago, because I was, and I think I initially brought the idea to Joe, and I go like. I would love to do this uh, fully immersive set. And we talked about doing a set that you can actually light from and do everything. So those ideas are kind of, you know, Joe and I have a great collaboration. We have each have an idea that may stop from here. But what's, what, what works really fantastic is that he, he says something, and then I'll say something, and then he says something, and you go like, and, it, and those are great moments. And how about this? And how about this? And how about this? And how about this? And then together we collaborate on a thing, and then we bring you know production designer in here and says, oh, okay, this will help solve our problem. A little bit of lighting here, a little little subtle thing here, and this is that's what I think makes a great uh, team on the movie. I think it's a collaborative profit between all departments. I need to be talking. I need to have a great close collaboration with production design. I need to have a close um, collaboration with the director, and I need to also have a very close collaboration with the VFX. There needs to, that is kind of just the circle of all that that makes uh, I think a really cohesive project. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I have a follow-up question to his question. Then, so once you've read the script and you've talked to the production designer, uh, at what stage do you choose a camera? And, and you talked a little bit about camera choice, but how do, how does this evolve? I um, mean, usually you read the script, you look at some references, and then you realize the task at hand. And I just feel like uh, this is what, for me, kind of picks the camera. And I kind of, I pick it kind of non-label centric. You know, I don't, I don't wave. I'm not a personal waver of any flag. You know, or in particular, I just, I just feel like this is the camera that's right for the show. And I, and I, and I start pretty much from scratch on every movie I've done. You know, I just, I see where everyone's at, try it again. And then I pick it from there. I mean, this last thing, I mean, it was ridiculous. I had, you know, I don't know if you've seen it. There's some pictures, I think Alex has it. Yeah, it There's like seven cameras on a 12-foot sled, and we're driving downtown on it. And, it. and it's, and I did that for the movie and showed it and sit down with the director on a 65-foot screen, you know, so, and we did 11K scans down to 4K, all projected 4K, all huge screens. And we saw, I showed them all the footage from 65 mil IMAX to 
Well, GoPro was a joke, but yeah, but then to, uh, to all the way down, all the cameras, red, Alexa, you know, and all showing the best that they had at the time. And, um, and then we picked something. We're still in flux, so I can't really say what exactly what it is, but it, there might be a combination of a bunch of cameras, maybe, you know. F65 is looking great right now, so, but it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I just make it one of the choice, so I. Anybody else have a last question? Okay. Any? Do you have any last comments? Sorry. Oh. Curtis, let's grab the mic. Yeah. Uh, Curtis Clark. Uh, let me just ask you a question about the candle. It's seen. It's really beautiful. Uh, did you shoot that wide open on the Master Primes? Yeah. Right. I thought so. I needed everything I can get. Yeah. No, that look, candle look. wasn't very bright. <laughs> Congratulations. It looks, it looks beautiful. Right. Wide open with a wrench. Oh yeah. So, Claudio, do you have I kept a, on going to the one? camera and going like, really, is there any? <laughs> well, that way we really pushed it all the way to the bottom. And it's, you know, that's a, like, it's unfortunate. I mean, you know the situation. I mean, and that's, that table was just longer than I really wanted it to be. <laughs> and I always kept on like, could we do two candles, you know? Like, at least I get a little bit closer to them. And there's like, no, one candle. Oh, well, on both sides. It's, They're pretty far away from each other, you know, from yeah. a standard table scene. It's know. extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you think just a few years ago, Barry Lyndon, uh, Kubrick had to use three wick candles and maybe 3,000 candles just to light I the asked one for scene. A three wick. That one, they couldn't get a three wick for that thing. It was, it was very a specific glass thing they built. And I, <laughs> and I was trying to get the fatter wicks in there, and they couldn't jam it down in there. I mean, I, I mean I'm telling you, I really tried to get it most. And then this ended up being the one that could fit in there was this little one. So it's not a... It's not even the glorious luxury of a triple wick or fatter wick or whatever I had uses in the past. In the past, I didn't have any of that. Good testimony to cameras and lenses. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our panelists. I have one one special shout out for Keslo Camera. Keslo, where are you guys? Keslo, right back there. Tremendous supporters of the film with Claudio. Thank you. We appreciate you all coming. Have a wonderful NAB, and uh, feel free to talk to our guests uh, following the session. Take care.